Welcome back, St. Fulas, and we are continuing with analyzing what we call errors and misconceptions that Matrix make on a show that is proudly brought to you with lots of love by Liberty. A very special shout out goes out to the people that are not only sponsoring this show, but they're also behind our awesome, awesome app, which is called the Tenfold Education app. If you don't have it, do make sure that you go to your app store and you download this awesome app. On YouTube, we are also available, guys. We know you enjoy watching videos. Please go there and find us your mindset learn once you're there do make sure that you uh, subscribe to that channel and you click this like button of all the videos that you find interesting and i promise you almost all of them in fact all of them are very interesting so do make sure that you click on them and you follow us so that every time when we upload new content you're able to see what we've uploaded like i said we are looking at errors and misconceptions and we're going now to the next part which is part four we'll be looking at finances growth and decay. Just to help you understand what are the common errors that we see that the metrics of the previous years have been making that you are likely to make to help you not to make the same errors. So uh, let's jump right into it. This is part four and it, it looks at finance growth and decay. Uh, remember in finances there's actually simple growth and decay, compound growth and decay. And then you're also going to have annuities. So the Biggest, 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 biggest misconception or biggest error that we see is that uh, people don't know which formula to use for the question. So you guys always pick the incorrect uh, formula to solve a problem because the finance questions, the growth and decay questions that we have are always weight problems. So I want to say this to you. If a question says simple interest, then it's going to obviously be the simple growth formula. And then if it says straight line depreciation, those are the key words. You then use this particular formula of straight line depreciation. Now, if the formula says compound growth of a single amount, okay, this is not if there is a lot of um, money paid. This is compound growth. If it says compound, you're going to use the compound growth, but it has to say to you that you're looking at a single deposit, okay, single uh, uh, amount, single amount that is being deposited into an account and it's growing on its own, and then you're going to use uh, this compound growth. The other reason that it will compel you to use the compound growth formula is if you're dealing with a population growth, uh, maybe let's say there's a, a, a population of penguins somewhere and they want to know how many penguins will they have in 2050, they give you the rate at which they've been growing, then you use the compound growth formula, maybe uh, if they talk about inflation, which is another reason that will compel you to use a compound growth formula. Those are the three times that you'll ever need to use a compound growth formula. When will you ever need to use uh, the compound depreciation formula? The question will say reducing balance depreciation. So when it says reducing balance depreciation, this is the formula that you have uh, to use. So please, please be careful of that. And then the annuities, when will you ever need to use the future value annuity? You will use the future value annuity if somebody is investing money. So this is money invested voluntarily, okay? Voluntary investment, okay, uh, of money growing from what? Growing in this way. This is how it's growing, okay? It's growing from zero to something. So if you read the question, you get to get, you to get the sense that money is growing from zero to something. So it grows. Somebody deposits money every month, every month, every month, every month, every month. And then eventually at the end of maybe five years, 10 years, whatever number of years you're looking at, you end up with something. So the point here is you start with nothing in that account and you are raising wealth. You're depositing money into an account and then eventually it becomes something which happens to be a lot of, uh, of money. And like the word annuity would suggest this is actually if it's continuous and it's over the same period, okay, it's periodic and it's... Uh, the same amount, okay? Same amount. You are depositing 200 every month, every month, every month to raise wealth, then that's the way the future value formula will come in. And the present value formula will be the one that you use if somebody talks to you about uh, the opposite of what the future video is uh, is talking to us about, okay? So if you have a situation where we start with something, uh, this something needs to be repaid to zero, okay? You start with something and then you want to repay it until it's nothing. What do I mean by that? Well, if I give you a loan, okay, we start with something and then we want to drive that until it is zero. We are repaying it slowly and slowly and slowly until we do not own 
or O in one. Okay, so loan questions are good examples of uh, formulas of problems that will require you to use the formula of the present value. Uh, maybe if you've got an, a, a, a retirement fund, okay? Retirement. If you've got a retirement fund uh, uh, that you are spending, not the retirement fund that you are raising, but you've got the retirement fund uh, that you 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 spend it, okay, you taking from take from the retirement fund, you spend in the money until it's nothing. Uh, the lottery, apparently if you win the lottery, they advise you to invest the money in the account until you don't have anything left there because you have actually chowed all the money that is in that particular uh, um, investment. Okay, so be careful of that. You start with something, a lump sum, and then you're spending all the money until you have nothing. Now, there are obviously going to be application questions that involve like the sinking fund story, the loan questions, like for example, if they say to you in the loan, uh, they give you a loan here, and then they say the person starts repaying uh, in, 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 let's say, in five months' time. So you will notice that T1, there's no payment, T2, there's no payment, T3, there's no payment, T4, the first payment is made, okay? Because of this uh, missed payment, you guys have to know that when this person comes back and tries to make these payments, okay, that they start making here at T4, for the, the, the period where they were not repaying the money back, we're going to charge them uh, a compound uh, growth calculation that will require us to take what they took as the loan amount, and then we're going to put that at whatever the interest is, and for, in this case, four months, it will give us what is the new debt. So it's gonna give us the p-value. This p-value is what you have exactly at this point here, one month before because we always need that gap before the first payment is made. So that p-value is what we're going to put in the present value formula, okay, which we have already discussed and we know very well that it's going to look uh, like this. So that's what you're going to put here. And maybe you might be asked to work out what the monthly payments are going to be, or you're going to be asked to work out uh, how long it will take the person to settle the debt. So what what is a, an error, what we notice all the time is people usually use the loan value for P and the, using the loan value for P is a big mistake, okay? Yes, you were given a certain amount here, so that will be wrong. Please do not use the wrong value for P, but use the compounded amount. That amount that is compounded is what you need to use here. So uh, please be careful of, uh, of that particular error. It's a common error to see almost the time almost all the time. Now the next thing is people don't know how to solve for the exponent because uh, financial math questions sometimes require you to work the value of n and n is an exponent in these questions. So when you are doing this question, remember if the base to the power of some exponent equals to some number, uh, the answer, which in this case I want to be the exponent, so the exponent would be the log, okay? The base that remains the base is going to come here and be a small number as the base of the log, and then what was the answer will definitely come uh, in the brackets here. So just know this, this conversion of solving for the exponent, if you've got an exponential form, you're trying to figure out what the value of the exponent is going to be. So that's another popular mistake that you see almost all, all the time. Right, so uh, this is actually the errors that you see in financial bets and finance growth, as well as a decay. Now we're going to go to calculus, differential calculus. We'll be looking at uh, what errors metrics generally make when they're doing uh, differential calculus. We'll be looking at in differentiation, what mistakes do they make? In the cubic graph, what mistakes do they make? And then in applications of calculus, what mistakes uh, do they generally make? So quickly, let's just see how that is going to actually pan out. So this is part five of our uh, misconceptions and errors that we see, generally speaking. So when you're looking at differential calculus, we've got limits. Uh, we're also going to have questions that talk about differentiation and there's the graphs as well and optimization uh, at the end. Now, starting first of all with differentiation, when you look at the first part where you guys have to work out differentiation, the popular mistake that we see is uh, people copy the question wrong. So notation is a problem, okay? Notation is a problem. If I give you y, when you derive, you have to say dy over dx. If I give you f of x, when you derive, you have to say f prime of x, okay? And this, this is actually very important. So do make sure that you follow the correct notation. The first principle formula is not f of x is the limit as h tends to zero, 
of f of x plus h minus f of x. So please, 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 please do make sure that you don't make mistakes. Uh, this has to be f prime. So that there is f prime. And then you have to do uh, correct substitution to find the correct solution when you're doing uh, this particular question. Now, if f of x is given to you as x squared, maybe let's say minus x, your f of x plus h, okay, f of x plus h, is obviously what you get when you put x plus h everywhere where there's x, okay? So you guys have to be very careful. You cannot call this x squared plus h squared. This implies incorrect expansion of the binomial, so it will be a big mistake. Please, please, please do make sure that you expand uh, correctly. This is a mistake. A binomial does not expand like that. It has to be uh, x squared, okay, plus 2xh plus h squared. So this is another mistake that you see when, when you guys are dealing with uh, these kinds of questions. And then in graphs, of course, the cubic graphs, there isn't really a lot of errors except just getting you to understand that you have to know your basics. You have to know that a cubic and its derivative, if this is f of x and the derivative is this one here, the turning point coordinates generally becomes the x-intercept in in this uh, derivative graph. So it's again an issue of, do I know my, my, my theory? Do I understand the path? Do I know what is going on? And do I know uh, the theory that is involved here? Just knowing, knowing your basics and knowing your theory will be very, very important. Okay, and then uh, maybe if you come to optimization problems, okay, just maybe messing up the formulas. You guys do not know the formulas for area when you're doing measurements questions, uh, uh, formulas for surface area, and formulas also for volume. So it's just a matter of you have to know your story. You have to know what area formulas are, what surface area formulas are, and what volume uh, uh, formulas are, so you don't confuse them. You just make like silly, silly, silly mistakes of not knowing uh, what the formula uh, is supposed to be for that particular section. And maybe I can just close this section by saying when you are deriving, if I say to you, y is the square root of x, okay, maybe let's say 3 times the square root of x plus 10x squared, when you're deriving, one of the errors that you've noticed is that people will say, okay, they know that this has to be 3 times x to the power half, and then they want to derive this part, okay? You cannot derive in parts. You can't derive this and not derive this one. You'll have a big, big, big problem. You have to really make sure that before you do this, you fix all of them. So you'll have this, and then this you keep it. Although it's ready for differentiation, you must derive everything all at once, and then you're going to have 3 halves x to the minus half, and then you're gonna have 20x to the power of one, and then you can be able to finish off uh, this question uh, very, very uh, easily. Right, now in closing quickly, we now have uh, part six, which talks about probability and counting principles. In probability and counting principles sections, you have to know your basics again, you have to know your theorems, but not your theorems, but your rules. Your probability rules, very, very, very important for you to understand them, and you know when to use which, which, which uh, rule, do not confuse the end rule and do not confuse the O rule as well. Then maybe perhaps the last thing I can say to you when it comes to uh, probability and counting principles is that you'll have probability rules. You'll have uh, Venn diagrams, tree diagrams, and then the two-way table as well. Uh, when you're doing Venn diagrams, just be careful because this is a common error of what is given in a Venn diagram. Are you given the number of items? Like is that the total number of the sample space being given as maybe let's say 30? And then there's four here, there's 11, I think that's 15. And then maybe there's, there's, there's 10 here, that's actually 25. And then you've got five here. Versus when you're given a Venn diagram that has probabilities, like 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, maybe and something else here, it might be x. Now here you're given the total number of the sample space, which must sum up to one all the time. So are you given values of the number of elements in each one of the circles, or are you given uh, probability? So that's, that's a confusion that we generally see uh, when we're dealing with this thing. So do make sure that you don't make that confusion. And then maybe in closing, when you're doing uh, counting methods, after you've worked out uh, the number of ways you can do something, okay, maybe let's say one times five times seven, this is just maybe the number of ways in which you can be able to do something. But when we ask for pro probability, remember the probability will always be your number of ways of doing something divided by the sample space. So we generally find that you guys don't remember that you need to divide what you've worked out as the total number of doing something uh, with the value of uh, the sample space. So I hope this has actually helped you to understand all the errors and uh, the misconceptions that we generally see when we're dealing with paper one. And I hope you guys will not make the same errors. Thank you very much for joining us. 
we're still going to continue giving you more content. Until we meet again next time, bye-bye.